Okay, this is going to be chapter 8, an introduction to atrial rhythms. Um, introduction to sinus rhythms or atrial rhythms. Uh, objectives. Discuss the origin of atrial rhythms. Recall the components of the electrical conduction system of the heart. Identify a wandering atrial pacemaker rhythm, including EKG characteristics. Describe a premature atrial contraction, including EKG characteristics. Identify atrial flutter rhythm, including EKG characteristics. Describe atrial fibrillation rhythm, including EKG characteristics. Describe supraventricular tachycardia, including EKG characteristics. Discuss clinical significance of atrial rhythms. Describe each KG characteristics of Wolf Parkinson's White syndrome. Origin of atrial rhythms. Rhythms are classified according to the heart structure in which they begin, or their site of origin. Sinoatrial node fails to generate an impulse. Atrial tissues or internodal pathways may initiate the impulse. Now, this origin of this beat is going to come from very close to the SA node. So the intrinsic rate will probably be the same as the SA node. This can also get us into problems sometimes. If the intrinsic rate of one SA node is 60 to 100 beats per minute, and we have another site that kicks up that's at the same intrinsic rate, it could double the heart rate very, very quickly. These are atrial dysrhythmias, rhythms not considered life-threatening or lethal, they must, however, provide continuous assessment to the patient. Components of the electrical conduction system. Electrical impulse originates in the sinoatrial node or the SA node, which is right here. Travels through the atria via the internodal pathways, which are these. Goes to the AV node, which is a brief pause and then goes to the bundle of hiss into the right and the left bundle branches and then on to the Purkinje fibers which actually transmitted into the muscle tissue that's what these little pair like projections are now each one of these again has an intrinsic rate intrinsic rate of the SA node 60 to 100 beats per minute AV node 40 to 60, and then the ventricular muscle, 20 to 40 beats per minute. Electrical conduction system of the heart. SA nodal firing rate, 60 to 100 beats per minute. AV nodal firing rate, 40 to 60 beats per minute. Purkinje network or ventricular muscle firing rate, 20 to 40 beats per minute. Pacemaker sites. Sinoatrial node is the primary pacemaker site. The backup site, the number two, is the AV node. So this one's number one. This one would be number two. The Purkinje network is number three. And if we'll notice, as we get lower and lower in the heart tissue, it slows down. So the AV node is running at a slower rate than the SA node. The Purkinje fibers or the muscle tissue is running at a lower rate than the AV node was. Wandering atrial pacemaker. They occur when a pacemaker site wanders or travels from SA node to other pacemaker sites in the atria, internodal pathways, or the AV node. The SA node remains the basic pacemaker. However, this is going to be very characteristic and very distinct, and it will look as if the P waves are not coming from the same location. A wandering atrial pacemaker rhythm, observation of at least three different looking P waves is required. Size and shape of the P waves vary according to the site of origin. The P waves may appear upright, inverted, or absent waveforms. The absence of P waves may indicate the P wave is buried in the QRS, or a PR interval may be regular, uh, very based on the point of origin, and produces no symptoms and only recognized by EKG observation. So this is very benign, 
you can have a wandering atrial pacemaker. However, this could prelude you to atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter or some other form of atrial dysrhythmia, as in an SVT. Wandering atrial pacemaker. And I'm going to start identifying these as we look at these tables and look at these rhythms as what makes it stand out from all other rhythms. So we're going to, we've already went through the five-step process in the previous slide set. So rate is generally normal. The rhythm may be slightly irregular, and that's because it's coming from different areas in the atria. So this is going to be a good uh, one to watch. Is there a P wave before ever QRS? And the answer is, is yes, but whenever we come to the question Puru, there's going to be a change in the shape, size, and location from beat to beat. And the identifying characteristics is more than three P waves in the same six second strip. What is the length of the PR interval? And this would be variable and would depend on <coughs> the actual site that the pacemaker site originated from. And step five. <clears throat> Do all the QRSs look alike? And the answer is yes. And what is the length of the QRS? And it's generally less than 0.12. So the two identifying characteristics, <clears throat> it may be slightly irregular. In the P waves, there's going to be more than three in the same six-second strip. And this is a wandering atrial pacemaker. <coughs> Pardon me. <clears throat> and if you'll look up here, the SA node is firing some of the time, <clears throat> but also this inner atrial pathway is changing pacemaker sites and firing as well. And what this does is, is if we'll look at this, this is a six second strip down at the bottom, the P waves look different. in every beat that P waves are changing. So if you have more than three, the rate is normal. You have a wandering atrial pacemaker. Multifocal atrial tachycardia. And this is a variant of the wandering atrial pacemaker. It occurs when the rate reaches 100 beats per minute or greater. So it's a tachycardia you have multiple P wave locations but the rate is faster than 100 beats per minute so what they call it is they call it multifocal atrial tachycardia it may be confused with atrial fibrillation sometimes because it does have some irregularity to it observed in patient with advanced chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or COPD digoxin toxicity and electrolyte imbalances and as we're looking at this, the thing that stands out on the wonder, this type of wandering atrial pacemaker, which it's the same pathology, it's coming from multiple locations in the atria, only each one of them, again, we can find three different P waves in the same six second strip, and the rate is greater than 100 beats per minute. So, one, two, three, four, Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. The rate on this is 120 beats per minute. The identifying factor for multifocal atrial tachycardia is more than three P waves in the same, same six second strip with a rate greater than 100 beats per minute. A premature atrial com contraction or complex, or a PAC, a single electrical impulse that originates outside the sinoatrial node and originates from the atria. It can occur in the atria, AV junction, or in the ventricles. The premature beat is a complex that arises earlier than ex the next expected beat. So this one beat is going to stand out. The word contraction commonly used to describe premature beats, all complexes represent only electrical activity of the heart. Complexes do not show mechanical activity, should use complexes rather than contraction. A premature atrial complex, an incomplete or non-compensatory pause often follows a PAC. 
looks like a normal looks like normal complexes of the underlying rhythm. Underlying rhythm is interpreted due to PAC. After non-compensatory pause, underlying rhythm of the heart returns and continues until the next PAC occurs. So that's a lot of verbiage for there's going to be one funny looking beat that's out of rhythm. And the P wave on it is going to look different because it comes from another uh, another section outside of the sinoatrial node. So when we go through the five step process, the rate is generally normal. The rhythm is all good except for that PAC that kind of throws a monkey wrench into it. <clears throat> In step three, is there a P wave before every QRS? Yes. Are the P waves upright and uniform? Yes. <clears throat> but whenever they have a PAC, that's going to differ in shape, size, and location from the normal P wave. So it's going to look funny. What is the length of the PR interval? And this depends on the pacemaker site. The PR interval, if the area of location where the P wave originated from, from the atria, is way over on the other side of the, in the left atrial area, it may take a little time for it to be conducted to the AV node. Um, step five, do all the complexes look alike? Yes, similar to the underlying QRS or underlying rhythm. And what is the QRS duration? And this is going to be normal, less than 0.12. So again, identifying characteristics of a PAC, things are going to become a normal until the PAC occurs. When the PAC occurs, it's going to form some sort of irregularity in the rhythm. So again, up here at the pacemaker sites, this is where they should normally come from. In this case here, you have an alternate site that adds its two cents. And if we'll look at the rhythm on this, these are nice and rhythmic. This one, however, is not. This is our PAC. If you'll notice and take a close look, the P wave in this one is different than the P wave in the rest of the beats. This guy is our culprit, or this guy is the premature atrial complex. Now, these can be perfused sometimes, and sometimes they won't be perfused, or they won't produce a pulse. The more that a patient has these, the greater chance, and, and the more the patient has these that are not perfused, the greater chance the patient has to have an alteration in hemodynamics or an alteration in blood pressure. A premature atrial complexes. Uh, two sequentially PACs occur in pairs. Atrial bigeminy is pretty much when a PAC is every other beat. And we're going to see this term again, this term bigeminy, whenever we start talking about the ventricular stuff. If, if you have a normal beat here, and then a PAC, and it occurs every other beat, that these two here would be the PACs, this is going to be called bigeminy. If it happens every third beat, we have a beat here, a beat here that is normal, and then we got a funky one, and it is occurring continuously every third beat, you have atrial trigeminy. Every two beats, bigeminy, every third beat, trigeminy. Premature atrial complexes, remember, Premature atrial complexes look like, very much like their normal complexes of the underlying rhythm, so sometimes they're hard to spot, especially if, they're, if they have some rhythm to them. Causes include the use of stimulants, caffeine, alcohol, hypoxia, increased sympathetic tone or your sympathetic nervous system from fear, anxiety, whatever that might cause an increase in sympathetic tone, imbalances of electrolyte, and digitalis toxicity. When any premature beat occurs more than six times per minute, it is termed frequent. So it doesn't matter if you have greater than six PACs or greater than six PVCs, which we'll learn about those in the ventricular area, which is a premature ventricular complex, we are going to consider them frequent. Reentry dysrhythmia. So the reactivation of myocardial tissue for a second or subsequent time by the same impulse. A short circuit of the electrical conduction system develop whenever a course of elect electrical impulse is delayed or blocked. 
Due to this delay, electrical impulse is allowed to travel in only one direction. The impulse moves in a cycle throughout the heart tissue. A series of fast depolarizations ensues. So, reentry pathway defects is what actually gives us SVTs. So, the reentry on this, and sometimes it's easier to look at it in a simpler model. And I'm going to draw a heart here with the conduction system on it. SA, AV node, right, left bundle branch. Okay, so let's just say, let me change ink colors here. All right. There we go. So SA node fires, goes across, allows the atria to contract, hits the AV node, and this area is conducted. And as it gets to the ventricular muscle, it is allowed in to hit the AV node the second time. This here is considered a reentry pathway depot. Um, how they correct this is they take you in and they do something called an ablation. The ablation will give you a controlled heart attack and not allow that section that would allow conduction or the re-entry of the electricity into the AV node again to conduct electricity anymore. So they give you a controlled heart attack in the spot that is the problem. If everyone will notice down here there is no visible P wave seen in or before our QRS, if, if noted. It could be inside of the QRS, but it still can be seen. One of the identifying factors that we notice in an SVT is no discernible P wave. Reentry dysrhythmias. Causes of reentry due to the conduction delays or blocks includes hyperkalemia, myocardial ischemia, or certain antidysrhythmic medication. Specific rhythms include atrial flutter, atrial fibrillation, premature atrial complexes, and proxismal supraventricular tachycardia. And the word proxismal here means that we can see it come or go, so that it doesn't sustain itself all the time, but yet whenever we do get the SVT or the supraventricular tachycardia, it becomes problematic. Atrial flutter. <clears throat> the presence of regular atrial activity with a picket fence or sawtooth pattern. A single irritable site in the atria initiates many electrical impulses at a rapid rate. A normal P wave not produced. Electrical impulses conducted through the atria at a very fast rate. Rather than the presence of a normally appearing P wave, a flutter or a sawtooth wave, also known as F waves, are patterned. AV node becomes a gatekeeper to the ventricles. Uh, based on the number of impulses, AV node accepts ventricular responses is established. So what this means is, is, let's see if we can get to it. We generally have them, and I'll go ahead and read this slide. Conduction ratios of 2 to 1, 2 atrial contractions for each ventricular contraction. Conduction ratio of 4 to 1, 4 atrial contractions for each ventricular contractions. An atrial rate of 300 beats per minute will parallel a ventricular rate of about 75 beats per minute. And this is, we're always going to see atrial flutter in a conduction ratio. And what that means is there's always going to be a 3 to 1 conduction, or a 4 to 1 conduction, or a 2 to 1 conduction. The faster the conduction, if you had a 2 to 1 conduction, the atrius can generate rates in excess of 200 to 300 beats per minute that would be very very rapid or a very rapid ventricular response. Atrial flutter with a slow ventricular response, ventricular rate of less than 60 beats per minute, 
an atrial flutter with a rapid ventricular response, a ventricular rate of 100 to 150 beats per minute. So to identify an atrial flutter, um, one, the very first one up here, the atrial rate is going to be faster than the ventricular rate, and the ventricular rate is going to be variable. The atrial rate will be running near 300 beats per minute, and the ventricular rate will be running less than that at whatever the conduction ratio is, whether it be 3 to 1, 4 to 1, 2 to 1, or, or whatever. What is the rhythm? And the atrial rhythm is going to be regular. The ventricular rhythm, however, by picking up those F waves or the stimulus that is occurring in the atria, those waves are going, when the AV node picks those waves up, it's going to take the strongest of those and say, okay, I'll beat with this one. So, but what we'll normally see is a true conduction pattern, though, of a 3 to 1, 4 to 1, and so on. Number three is there P waves before every QRS. Normal P waves are absent. They are replaced by the F waves or the sawtooth pattern. And the Puru doesn't even doesn't even count. There's no upright uniform P waves whatsoever. They're moving at 300 beats per minute. What is the length of the PR interval? And it's not measurable because we cannot find a P wave that is associated. We have an F wave that is associated. On step five, do all the QRSs look alike? And they're usually less than 0.12 or three small boxes on the five step process. So again, the identification is going to be by the top one up here where you have a faster atrial rate than a ventricular rate, and there's a sawtooth pattern in between the QRSs. The top one here is atrial flutter, and it is a 3 to 1 conduction. Boom. 1, 2, 3 to 1 conduction. The bottom one also is atrial flutter. It looks like shark teeth in between the QRSs, and this is a 2 to 1 conduction. So up top, 3 to 1. At the bottom, 2 to 1. Atrial fibrillation rhythm. One of the most common atrial dysrhythmias is AFib. Uh, presents with three definite, definite characteristics. There are no notable P waves is the first one. The P waves are replaced by F waves and these F waves here are going to be lower in amplitude. The ventricular response rate is totally irregular or termed irregularly irregular. Now whenever we were in identifying the five-step process and we identified the regularity of things, I told you that there was only one rhythm that we could identify as irregularly irregular, and that is this rhythm here, which is atrial fibrillation. By looking at the last beat, you should be able to identify where the next beat is going to occur. And in the patient with atrial fibrillation, whenever you see the irregularity, there is no way that you can determine where the next beat is going to fall. The QRS complexes are usually within normal limits. Multiple ectopic foci from within the atria blitzing the AV node. So all of this information is coming at the AV node. The AV node is unable to handle or conduct each of the impulses. The AV node allows impulses to enter the conduction system at random. And that randomness that it allows the impulses to enter the conduction system is why we get an irregularly irregular rhythm. So what is the rate? Well the atrial rate is generally absurd and way off of our ability to count. We're going to see squiggly lines. Each one of these squiggly lines would be an F wave. The ventricular rate is going to be variable. We're going to identify this rhythm right here by its being irregularly irregular. Is there a P wave before every QRS? Well, the P waves are absent and they're replaced by F waves and there's no PURU. We cannot determine a PR interval. Do the QRSs all look alike? Yes, generally. And what is the length of the QRS complexes? And this is again is going to be, it says here 0 0.10. If it is less than 0.12, it would still be within normal limits. This is atrial fibrillation. Again, we're going to identify it by these two things right here. The atria are going to be running or fibrillating at 350 to 400 beats per minute, and the rhythm itself is going to be irregularly irregular. The R to R interval here is going to be different 
on each one of these beads. And we cannot tell which one of those fibrillation waves are actually going to fire off our QRS. We still would do the five step process. Step one in this, what's the rate? Since it's irregular, the easiest way to do the rate is to count the complexes in the six second strip and multiply by 10. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Rate is 90 beats per minute. Step two in this, is it regular? And if, if we can take a look at the atrial firing here, it's occurring way more than we can, we can count accurately. There's tons of atrial firing and very little ventricular firing, or QRSs. So they're, they're, it's coming out of the atria faster than the ventricles can keep up. It's regularity. It is irregularly irregular. Step three in this is going to be, uh, are there P waves and is it Puru? And there's no discernible P wave in atrial fibrillation. You have all of these fibrillation waves in between the QRSs. Is there a PR interval? And there is not a PR interval in this. Um, step five. What does the QRSs look like? The QRSs in this case are 0 0.08, are two small boxes. They're generally less than 0 0.12. Atrial fib is identified by it being irregularly irregular and the F waves in between the QRS complexes. Atrial fibrillation rhythm. Rhythm may be chronic in nature, commonly associated with underlying heart disease like congestive heart failure or rheumatic heart disease. Also, hypoxia, myocardial infarction, dig toxicity, and electrolyte imbalances. Treatment. Uh, for a slow heart rate, less than 80 beats per minute to 100 if rapid. Uh, done with monitoring and digitalis. Encompasses all fast tachydysrhythmias in which the heart rate is greater than 100 beats per minute. Superventricular tachycardias. This applies to any tachycardic rhythm originating above the ventricles. Proxismal refers to its sudden onset or cessation. So it, start, it started and stopped that we witnessed it. Makes it proxismal or PSVT. If it's sustained whenever we get there and make our assessment, <clears throat> then it is SVT. It is no longer proxismal. Superventricular tachycardia rhythms occurs when rapid atrial ectopic focus overrides the SA node and becomes the heart's primary pacemaker site. Can resemble a rapid sinus tachycardia. <coughs> sinus tachycardia uh, seldom exceeds 160 beats per minute to 170 at high ranges. If it's over this, it, there's a very good chance it could be an SVT over 170. So as we're looking at this, what is the rate? Well, the rate 1 is going to be greater than 150 beats per minute. So greater than 150, that's going to be one of the identifying features. It is pretty regular. However, the big identifying feature is right here, that we have a rate greater than 150 beats per minute with no P wave. And we'll take a look up here. Even the bottom, 300, 150, it is greater than 150 beats per minute even on the bottom. The top rate is almost 300 beats per minute. If we find a big line, which is about here, here's the next one, and then the next one, that's about the distance of one big box, which would make the rate at about 300 beats per minute. If we'll look here, there is no discernible P wave that we can see, even down here at the one that's running at about 150 beats per minute, still no discernible P wave. This is a T wave. You have to have a repolarization wave. You do not have to have a P wave. The identifying factors of an SVT rate greater than 150 beats per minute with no discernible P wave. Causes can be overexertion, stress, hypoxia, excessive use of stimulants, hypokalemia, and atherosclerotic heart disease. Uh, treatments on this is going to be vagal maneuver, stimulation of the vagus nerve, releases acetylcholine, resulting in slowing of the heart rate. <clears throat> These are going to be done by telling the patient to 
bear down, to cough, to squat. Uh, blowing on a syringe can increase intrathoracic pressure. All of these are some of these are going to be off of reflexes. Example: uh, dunking someone's face in ice cold water can also increase vagal tone. This would be the mammalian diving reflex. Having them blow on a closed syringe is herring bearer's reflex. Um, we generally don't do carotid massage. The reason we don't do carotid massage is unless we can assess the plaques that are built up in their carotid arteries, we could actually give the patient a stroke. Uh, the way that you would determine whether or not they had build up in their carotid arteries is through listening for breweries. Um However, it is not a good idea to massage someone that is in the cardiac ears and their carotid sinus. Uh, drug therapy, uh, such as adenosine and or synchronized cardioversion. Whenever we get to ACLS, we'll define this even more. Adenosine is utilized for patients that are stable, and the unstable patient, we are going to use synchronized cardioversion. Wolf Parkinson's White Syndrome, or WBW, WPW, characterized by two AV conduction pathways, identified by a delta wave seen on the EKG. QRS is greater than uh, 0.10 seconds due to ventricles uh, stimulated by impulse originated outside the normal conduction pathway. And the identification of the delta wave is a very, very short PR interval with a diagonal PR interval. So this, this P wave, before it even ends, it's going to pop up into the actual QRS complex and that it would be the formation of a delta wave or a delta wave. This is how we would identify Wolf Parkinson's White Syndrome. This is going to conclude chapter 8 of atrial dysrhythmias.